APS Films. the news like a normal person, but that changed when my family became the headline. My little sister Alice was murdered in 2013, and I've been trying to figure out how to live in this new reality ever since. I'm constantly trying to find a balance between keeping too many memories around, which could be painful and keeping too few around, which makes me feel like I'm not honoring Alice properly. My children have stuffed animals passed down from their Aunt Alice, although only my oldest ever got to meet her. My daughter's middle name is Alice. I even got a tattoo of Alice across my heart and a sunflower, which was Alice's favorite flower. I've been reaching for anything to feel connected to Alice. I even bought a convertible like the one Alice had. It's some type of ridiculous, expensive tribute to her. I'm ready to give up the car now. The money from the sale of the car will fund this film. This is a better way to keep her memory alive. a developing story right now out of Thunderbolt, an overnight shooting in which two people are dead. That's right, Mike. If you can see those red stairs that lead up to the black door, we're told that both of their bodies were found there. Police have identified 27-year-old Forrest Ison and 24-year-old Alice Stevens. 27-year-old Forrest Ison and 24-year-old Alice Stevens shot outside their Robertson Avenue home. One of the victims died on the scene. The other died on the way to the hospital. You sitting up, little fancy pants. Hi. Oh, all right. Sir, please approach the window. Yes. Welcome to Al Burger. Would you like a four piece or a six piece? Six piece. Okay. Boop, 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 boop. Have a nice day, sir. Come back and see you soon. I can't find that here. Alright, let's all lay down. Well, we don't turn the light on. Look up. Look at the stars. Although I don't want to forget her, I also really don't want to feel like this forever. I've decided to attack my feelings more head on. I'm going to travel across the country, meeting some of the most important people from Alice's life. And hopefully, I can gain a better understanding of who she was and how she could meet this kind of end, and maybe even get some closure. Hey, Carl, she's missing the best day. Eight, nine, ten. Everybody smile for the cameras. <laughs> Hey. Hi. They were on TV, yay! We're on TV! 
I met Alice, I'd say she was around one or two. It was 1990, and I went up to Maine, up to Kennebunk, and um, walked in the house to see this cute little, I like to call her Mowgli. <laughs> When I think of Alice, I think of an ethereal nymph. <laughs> she would flit about from one thing to the next, and she was fantastic at so many things. It was almost as if she was leaving a trail of sparkle wherever she went. Let's see what the maniac does. Hi, Alice. It was a lot of fun. Alice was caring, loving. She just always lit up the room when I was there. When we came to visit, she was always playing with boys. And she's just always just fun to be around. I can't remember the exact time or place that we met. I just know that it was at Chevrus. And I remember I had a hard time when I first transferred. But as soon as I met Alice, my year got so much better. Alice and I got our belly buttons pierced together. And she was like, okay, first step is ask your mom. Second step is I'll talk you through the pain. Obviously, I was deathly afraid and she was fearless. And I said the only way I would do it is if she went first and if she documented it. So she brought her camera and took pictures of several steps along the way. That was Alice getting ready to get her belly button pierced. This was Alice standing up right before he put the needle through her belly button. And this was as she was getting her belly button pierced. She was actually putting the needle in, and I took a picture of her um, just to get her reaction, <laughs> to know if I should be afraid. It's me getting my belly button pierced, and that's me after I got it done. Super proud of myself. <laughs> and that's the end product of us getting our belly buttons pierced together. Um, I still have mine. I will never take it out. She was very loving. Um, she was very caring. She never wanted anyone to feel left out. Um, <sighs> At first, I thought Gramps had died. So I, I mean, I was definitely taken back, but I, I kind of expected it over that time because he was getting very sick and all that. And then it, it hit me that she had died and it, it was a terrible feeling that day. Maybe from my father, right? Our father, I'm, 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 I'm a pretty matter-of-fact to the point I like to understand things. I, I quickly do better when I'm trying to grasp and, and understand. Not that any death is explainable, but, you know, an accidental death or my mother dying from cancer, you know, you kind of saw it coming. Um, while, while tragic, at least you had time to prepare. I mean, Alice was so young, just getting started with her life. I needed to try to make some sense of what just happened. Thank you. 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 To the storage unit, and I want you to see what I have to deal with. Yeah, no, we'll go. Totally. Hmm. All right, well, we'll go by the beach, and then we'll meet you in about an hour. Okay, you be okay. careful. Don't stay outside. I'm not going to go outside, yeah. All right. Bye, Jenny. Well, Alice, first of all, was attached to my leg. Do you remember that? <laughs> I used to teach Sunday school, and she was attached to my leg all the time. <laughs> so this was one of Alice's gymnastics uh, pictures. She was really little then. She was up at uh, Main Academy then, so that must have been probably about third or fourth grade. 
It was funny. She didn't do exactly what they said to do either, so that was part of it. What, in the photo, or? Well, see, her hand is kind of loose. The, breaths, uh, the others are kind of really, you know, and they kept saying, you've got spaghetti arms, but she would never, like, really... And, of course, the two but of why you... Why is it cut? I don't know. Why is there a broken heart? I know. Well, isn't that appropriate? <laughs> These are some of her clothes that I haven't been able to deal with. And Alice did this for her graduation from um, high school. She always wore perfume, which gave me an asthma attack every time I was around her. She loved her dad. She took that, had that picture made, even before, I think, not even asking me about it. Well, no, that's her main, actually. Remember when she went and moved upstairs and had that room yes. up there? And uh, so we had everything very colorful, and she wanted uh, stars on the ceiling, and... Yep. Oh, and then this was out at Phillips. That's rehearsal dinner and the wedding. Look at you with your... <laughs> and Alice was so sweet. Uh, and then these are just pictures that we took along the way. The Grand Canyon. Oh, you were always holding her hand. You were always... And look at this. You always had your arm around her. She was always happy with you, I have to say. Growing up, Alice and I were very, very close. I was very excited to have a little sister, and being an older brother, I wanted to be super hands-on in her life, and I wanted to, to do things for her. I've heard stories about how Alice didn't learn to talk for a long time because she would talk in this gibberish, and I would know what it was, and then I would just get whatever it was that she wanted for her because I didn't want her to have to worry about learning English, I guess. My family used to spend summers on Islesboro, an island off the coast of Maine. And we would bring friends and have fun, and that's where I have my fondest childhood memories with Alice. And we went to school and we had a lot of friends, but we were always there for each other. We were always pretty much the only other person we felt like we could count on. Well, this is Edwin. He's... Good one, Edwin! Run! Okay, turn around this way. Give Edwin a hug. Say, good job, Edwin. Good job, Edwin. She used to journal. So that's something that she did when she was little. Recently, my mother gave me access to Alice's old journals and letters. I finally feel like I'm ready to go through them for the first time. Here's some random stuff about me I'd like you to know if you don't already. I was born in Bakersfield, California, to my mom who was 16 and in high school. My dad was half black, and my mom was 5'2 with blonde hair and blue eyes. I was adopted immediately, and within a day, I was on my way home in an old station wagon in Maine with my brother Ed, who you'll be hearing a lot about, and my parents. I have three older brothers. Ed is 19, Mark is 35, and Philip would have been 42 this year. Philip was the only one of my brothers who experimented with drugs. He then became an alcoholic and killed himself two months after his second marriage last July. My father used to smoke cigarettes for years. He survived two different types of cancer, one in his tongue and one in a nerve on the right side of his face. He's had plastic surgery to make his face look as normal as possible, yet there's only so much they could fix. The most amazing thing I've ever heard was that before he went into his surgery, he told the doctor, I don't care about what I look like or how much people stare. All I want you to do is assure me I'll be at my kids' graduations. <laughs> you know, I don't really remember her ever doing homework or studying. <laughs> I feel like she was always just having a good time. Well, I think in ninth grade we started worrying about um, her, you know, her pranks, which weren't so good. And then that's, well, you know, uh, skipping uh, mass to go get a manicure. Did Audrey tell you about that? Let's see. And then she was acting really nasty if she didn't get her way about things. And she really 
you know, felt that she needed new clothes and was talking about the car she was going to get, and it was just kind of really getting out of control. But when you say nasty, what kind of things would she say? She calls me a fucking biatch. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think Philip's suicide and I think Penn's cancer really very deeply affected her. And uh, I think she realized that she wanted to have fun. So we got really worried about that, that she was going to get into trouble. So I was seeing a therapist to try to see what can I do for Alice. Well, she said, well, maybe Alice will talk to me. So we made an agreement that Alice was going to go talk to this person and um, uh, for three or four sessions, OK? Alice got in there and didn't say a word. So I paid $125 for Alice to go three or four weeks and not say a word. We had told her that if she could get a job and get into one of her sports, she wouldn't have to go. And she just thought we were kidding. She picked out a big rock. I don't know if you picked out your own rock or what, but she had this big heavy rock that she had to carry around with her all the time. And on there were the burdens that you were carrying with you and you were trying to work through. I really hate that rock. I imagine myself hiking up a huge mountain and at the top having a revelation and throwing Muffin off to a place that I would never see him again. But that moment never came. Muffin actually came home with me on September 4th. I guess I realized that although I know what needs to happen to get rid of Muffin, I wasn't completely capable of doing those things yet. Here's some of her baby clothes. This is the first the first outfit she had coming home from the hospital. That size, she was, she was. We thought she was going to be very tiny because the mother was tiny, and here she was two weeks late, so she was eight pounds fourteen ounces. <laughs> Alice Stevens, nine two eighty nine. A little knickknacks, baby pillow. The only person she ever dismissed was her mom. I think she fought with her mother more than the typical teenage girl would fight with their mother. I don't really know where the anger came from. Um, from what I could tell, Dorothy, you know, she's a great mom, was and is. She, you know, always wanted to make sure that Alice was happy and taken care of. So I don't really know why it was strained, why there was issues. Some of this, she had a little wrong. This is daddy. Daddy starts with E. Dorothy loved Alice beyond measure. She would do anything for that girl. And Alice loved Dorothy and just wanted to be all of the things she perceived Dorothy wanting her to be. And so they were both setting their own impossible standards to meet, not realizing that if they just stripped all the rest of it away, they loved each other and were enough for each other already. A couple more of Alice's paintings that I think she was just having fun with. But I can't give them away. Or <laughs> throw them out. I think, whoops. Some more of her trying to be organized. <coughs> Somebody gave her this. freshman year of high school. There was this girl in my art class freshman year 
who had a huge crush on him. And so she talked about him a lot. And uh, I remember her being very upset. Um, and she said that he liked me. <laughs> it's funny because after him and I dated the first time, uh, my sister would always make comments about, oh, you should get back with Ed, you should get back with Ed. Remember Ed? Remember when you used to date Ed? And I would always get so annoyed. <laughs> Be like, yeah, I know, I know, he was the best guy ever, and I let him go. I know, you're rubbing it in my face. And then when Ed and I started talking again, she was like, see, I told you, I told you. <laughs> so Ed went apartment searching for us while I was still in Maine, and he sent me this super adorable video of like him touring the apartment. It was really nice. <laughs> When we finally settled on this house, we were both on the same page. We both had the same vision. Like we just, we could see ourselves here together. My soon to be wife at that time and I had just bought a house in LA and we were very excited. And I'd agreed to help my old roommate move out of his uh, apartment. So we go to get the, the U-Haul. I'm already kind of stressed out because I'm getting married at the end of the week. We have a kid on the way, we're moving to the new house. But uh, I'd agreed to, to help him move, so I felt like it was only fair to fall through in it. And, uh, and Cece calls me. Ed's mom had called me, like, all in a panic. And she was like, well, I need to get a hold of him. I, I have something to tell him. I need to talk to him. But she wouldn't tell me anything. And so I told her that I would call him and let him know. And she says, I just got a call from your mom. She seems really stressed out. And uh, I wonder if he should try to get a hold of her. So I finally get a hold of her when we're at Nate's storage unit moving out, and she tells me, um, she said that Alice is dead. Phone rings, and I see it's Mimi, and uh, you could just tell. There was a pause, and there was sobbing, and there was you know, right out with it, just Alice is dead. And, um, you know, I got weak in the knees. I kind of went down to my knees on the table and I was like, uh, and I was just trying to say, you know, wh like what happened? And then she said she was murdered. You know, we didn't have a lot of details, uh, but she did mention Chief uh, Bob Merriman. I got the call at my residence, responded to Robertson Avenue. <laughs> We interviewed the uh, neighbors. It was called a canvas. So we canvassed the neighborhood uh, uh, up and down, not only Robertson, but Casino, uh, Gilbert, and all the streets surrounding that area. I remember I said to him, um, you know, how can I help? Like, I, I, just, I just want to understand. And how can I help? And he basically said, you need to get here tomorrow. I found my way over to Thunderbolt, and uh, I met Chief Merriman for the first time. You know, got a little bit of a debrief from him. Two people shot at point-blank range. It was a gruesome scene. But he definitely spent a lot of time getting me mentally prepared to walk into that house. It was a house like I would expect. It was a little southern bungalow. We went inside, and the first thing that I noticed was the smell. I mean, it was terrible. I mean, what we saw there was, was awful. Um, what was it like? Do you really want to know? There was shit, literally animal shit, on everything, everything. The bed, the blanket, the pillows, the sofa, everything. And some of it was very old, not a day old, not a week old, like a month old. And Alice always loved animals, so it didn't surprise me that she would have animals, but the smell told me that they weren't necessarily cared for very well. That's what Merriman was really reacting to. I mean, this outside scene was gruesome, but he started to understand who Alice was, right? He understood her background, who she came from, you know, the family. And he was like, I can't, I can't fathom how they live like this. I don't know 
what that cleared up for me, except that the picture that I had in my head of the life Alice was living was not the same as the reality. They build it for the person who doesn't like their traditional school and is not living up to their potential. And they got a lot of kids who came there with behavior or drug problems. And Alice was very offended that we put her into that situation because she hadn't done that at that time. She butted heads with her mom. And I think she thought she was going home after the wilderness program. And I think that festered into a lot of resentment um, because I think she had a different idea coming out of the wilderness program. If she did X, Y, Z, then she was gonna be able to go home. She dated someone there at Olivarian that um, probably had done some things that she could never imagine doing, but she really saw the good in that person. She seemed happy up to Olivarian school, but then she would say, well, I'm just gonna learn all the, the things that these other people are doing here, all the bad stuff they do, so I'm just learning more of that than, than anything. Whether the Olivarian school helped or hurt her, I don't know. She got accepted at the University of Denver she got accepted at the University of Loyola in Chicago. She really got accepted at good schools. She went to High Point because the boyfriend got accepted there. The first time I met Alice was at High Point University. We were freshman year roommates. So I walked into her freshman year dorm room and I just remember thinking she was so gorgeous. This girl is drop dead gorgeous. We met the first night because we were all out in the hall, but then uh, we got a little bit closer when it came to like going to the calf and just being around each other. I went on a camping trip and I I was the only one out of her friends going on this camping trip and I like opened my bag in front of like the instructor and Alice had left me a note and a giant black dildo on top of all of my things. Balls. That's what we called her. <laughs> the girl had balls. She was always there. Like, we stuck together. And she didn't care enough to worry about what you thought of her. She was just giving you who she is. She always wanted everybody to be happy, and she would do anything to make you happy, whether it was bringing you your favorite candy or just wanting to go for a ride to listen to music. Did you know her when she was dating Dan? Yes. Yeah, do you know about that whole thing? What happened there? So I actually got a lot of those phone calls. Sometimes they would argue in front of people, and then he would get a little violent. And me being the, the fake badass that I was, I kept a bat in my car. And so I would go over there, and I think it happened three times that I went over there, and finally I had to sit down with her one-on-one. -on -one. I said, listen, I'm not going to hit him. I just want to scare him. But if you keep coming over here, it's letting me know that you really don't care what happens next. It was a, a tainted relationship that she definitely needed to get out of, but it just ended up working out that he got kicked out of school, and that was pretty much their last draw. I, I don't think Alice wanted to admit it, that, she, that these were abusive relationships. And even when she was dating a really good guy, she would make it become like an abusive relationship. Why, how? Um, so I think she would initiate a lot of fights and try to like physically like push them. Then when Forrest came into the picture, this bad boy, you know, so that's kind of what changed that. She saw this fun, rebellious attitude, older guy, so yeah, she was drawn to that. Alice was a waitress at a restaurant in High Point, and Forrest was one of the chefs there. And I do remember the first few weeks of the meeting. He was a nice enough guy, but just something about him made us not really love that that was the influence on Alice. I think she felt like he really loved her, and she felt that he loved her unconditionally, and I don't think she ever really believed that before.
And then once she dropped out of High Point University, we kind of started seeing her less as well. I think that's when Forrest really came into her life. I know they were in love. Mm -hmm. And I think we could confidently say that she was the one for him. Yeah. Just, just by the way, I, you could tell he's, he, the smile that he carried and, and, you know, things of that nature. And at first, Forrest said he didn't want to be involved with anybody because he was concentrating on his career. But then he, um, they got together. So Alice uh, was trying to regroup, and she's like, well, what do I like to do? I think I like photography. At that point, I think my parents were like, oh my god, thank god she has an interest that she wants to pursue. Just, just go to photography school. So Alice got accepted into SCAD, the Savannah College of Art and Design, and he moved to Savannah with her. I guess they were close enough at that point that they didn't want to be apart. SCAD was too much for her because those kids, they were serious. They had been developing their art for a long time. And Alice could have. She could have, but she didn't want to expend the energy on it. And she called me and she said, I missed my first class. I'm like, how, how, do you, how do you do that? And, you know, she, obviously, I mean, things happened and uh, she lost her key and couldn't get there and... Brianna, yeah, no, I think she was at the gas station because she was getting something to drink and her key broke and she couldn't start the car. And then the professor said, you know, get out of my class. And that was it. And I think she decided then and there that that wasn't going to happen. She was struggling, but we all struggle at some point in life. I wonder what would have happened if she were given the opportunity to get out of a rut. Why did she trust people that didn't deserve to be trusted? Why did she give people so many chances to earn her trust back? And why on earth was she hanging out with people who had severe criminal records? These questions haunt me. It hurt. Primarily because I felt like I didn't talk to her enough, like what happened. There was all of those whys of what happened. A homicide, you know, the, you would, that's something serious. So I'd really thought they started hanging out with the wrong people and got wrapped up in drugs. Someone owed someone money. I don't know. Chief obviously had some theories. Was there something people were trying to get in the house? Were they trying to be robbed? Did they have money? Did they have drugs? All those type of theories he was putting out there on the table. It was a crime that stunned Thunderbolt. A couple found shot to death in their home. Well, tonight, police say they know who did it. Those men are Nathaniel Wilkins and Michael Jones, both are charged with malice murder. The big question here, though, why would this couple be gunned down? got his sister to drive, who was Mike Jones' girlfriend at the time, Tracy Wilkins. Tracy was driving. Uh, Nate and Mike followed him. They were at that convenience store right around the corner from the house by the school. They have them on videotape there. They have Forrest and Alice there coming back, had a fun night out. And within 10 minutes after that, they have the 911 call. They left getting gas. They drove down the road, they pulled up to the house, they were going inside for the night, um, and that's when they believe that Tracy pulled up, Mike and Nate got out of the car. At some point, uh, they shot, and then one of the neighbors told us that they heard Alice scream. The story started to unwind that Nate was a dishwasher at the restaurant, and uh, Forrest and Nate got into it a few times at the restaurant. I guess at some point he fired Nate, and Nate felt uh, disrespected. Uh, that was what he believed the whole motive of this crime was, was that Nate Wilkins was disrespected and uh, pissed off because Forrest fired him. There's no trace to Alice being involved in this, right? I mean, that's probably the most tragic part from where I sit is that she's just, boy, you know, that was her boyfriend. 
she was just coming home, right? I mean, just think if she got sick that night or didn't go out or went somewhere else. I mean, is she alive? I didn't even know she was in Savannah until like a year before she passed away. Um, correction, a year before she was murdered. And I totally regret not spending time with her, you know, not reconnecting, not seeing her. And I always wonder if it would have made a difference. If somehow, you know, I don't know, maybe they wouldn't have been home if, if something else was changed. Savannah, Georgia, a historic and beautiful small city bustling with restaurants and bars, tourists and art students, liberals and old money geriatrics. This is my dream town. The perfect stop for some fun and self-exploration I dream for on my life map. Yet here I am on this crisp sunny morning wanting to stay sprawled out like a jumping jack in bed. Yesterday morning, I woke up to dog shit on the floor, a shot of Captain Morgan straight out of the bottle, and no job to head off to. I don't feel I lack confidence or creativity. I learn quickly, and I think I'd be quite an asset to any company or business that I could be a part of. Where have I gone wrong? She called at about, I think it was 2, 2.30 in the morning and um, crying. I don't really know the, the actual details of it, um, but he pushed her up against her, the refrigerator. She has a black eye. Um, he strangled her. She had marks around her throat. And I think it's that next step that I think scared the bejesus out of her, you know, scared the living shit out of her. He tried to strangle her. So she called the police and then he went to jail. Every day she wrote to him. She's apologizing to him after that in notes. Forrest, I know you're mad and you hate me. I fucked up a lot. I'm sorry. Guess I am as stupid as you think I am. I love you forever. Alice. I felt really helpless and I went to this therapist, okay? and. She so depressed me, she said it happens six or seven times before the person finally gets enough nerve to leave if they're not dead. She loved everyone else. She just didn't love herself the same. She knew she was adopted and she loved all of her family, but she had that question of why. It was hard for me to understand because knowing Alice's family, I know that they loved her more than anything, but I think the fact that her birth parents gave her up was very hard for her to, she never really came to terms with that. People don't listen to that either. I said that real adoption really bothered her and I, they said, but she was in such a great family and you loved her and you gave her so much. They don't understand the adoption really bothered her, that she was given up for adoption. And I'll tell you another thing, Alice has said that she would rather have an abortion than put her child up for adoption. How does it make you feel? It doesn't make me, I wanted anything to do anything to help her feel better. I've never seen such a waste of potential and such sadness that she asked for so little of her life and her relationships. I, I did not, it did not bother me at all, at all. She stayed with him and she, as it tends to happen in the domestic violence cycle, she kind of cut herself off from her family. She didn't talk to us very much. All of a sudden, this happy-go-lucky girl that we knew growing up had changed. I don't know what I was meant to do in life. I feel like I missed my chance at whatever it was. I was supposed to be good at something. I know I was. It's like I missed the last bus to what I was supposed to do. And now I have to walk there. And along the way, Everyone in my life is handing me cups of water, like a marathon, except instead of cheering me on, they're all yelling for me to go faster and throwing shit at me because I'm in last place and lost. I think she felt ashamed and I think she was depressed because she knew it's where she wasn't where she wanted to be. You know, she kind of made a five-year plan and she wasn't anywhere near accomplishing anything. Alice called me and she said, I really need some help. And I said, okay, what, what can I help you with? 
She said I need to borrow $500 for an abortion. I need to, I need to get an abortion. And I always wanted to give her money if she ever asked, but at that point, we were saving for the wedding. It was a significant amount of money. And I said, Alice, if you want to get this taken care of, I think you have to confront mom, and I think you'll be surprised how forgiving she can be. So she did get the abortion done, and, uh, and my mom became aware of everything, and Alice said she was very cool about it, and that's like one of the last texts I got from her. I remember talking to my mom and saying, we can't do this. It's five days before the wedding. But she felt that, you know, everyone was already coming. Everyone had already made plans. But having some sort of hope and levity to that weekend would make the funeral more bearable. Yeah, that, that just, is, just that for the record, he already threw up a couple times. <laughs> it's kind of gross. <laughs> the editing is amazing, that's right. But the thing is, the wedding is always going to be associated with the funeral. Daddy. I'm going to go marry your mom. Yeah. Are you? I sure okay. am. I sure okay. am. Okay. Okay. Oh. Let's make this official, huh? There's a concept in Celtic Christianity called thin places. And a thin place is where humanity and divinity meet. And there's just this place where everything just kind of comes together. Cece and Edwin's wedding was a thin place. And there was commingled joy and grief that created this emotion I had never seen or experienced before. And it was so holy. Like even new life that marriage engenders. So perhaps the best that we can say is we come today honestly acknowledging our sadness and choosing for now to celebrate, to give our hearts to Edwin and Cecilia and they to one another. Cece had chosen these really nice black bridesmaid dresses and it had a whole different feel now that one of the bridesmaids wasn't there. Alice was, uh, was represented by this vase of flowers that stood in the place where she should have been standing. Every funeral, wedding, everything we've ever been to, nothing had this same sublime sense of peace about it. That was a peace that you can't explain away. It was a peace that had to come from someplace else because these two people were able in this indescribable moment of grief to allow their love to be bigger than that, even if just for that moment. I went back to the hotel to sleep, and then I went and helped their parish priest with Alice's funeral the next day. who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. The funeral service was the day after our wedding. 
Alice had on the bridesmaid dress that I had picked out for her. It was really hard seeing her in the casket with that dress on. The worst part was watching my father bury another kid, for sure. I had watched him bury my brother, and uh, he had already been beaten down. He had lost his first wife. But burying his second kid was just too much to bear. That's the first time I saw Mark break down. Yeah. The only other time I've seen Mark cry is when Phil, when they found Phil. Today we are here to mourn with the support and love of each other, the death of our daughter, sister, aunt, cousin, friend, Alice Pinkton Stevens. Many of you have heard me groan about Alice, her lack of direction, too much drinking, her inability to follow through on things, her lack of focus on things that needed to be taken care of. I keep asking myself, has Alice really moved through life without any great personal achievements or contributions? One of the hardest parts of that was when Mrs. Stevens gave a eulogy for Alice. It felt like Dorothy was disappointed in Alice, and I know that she wasn't. And I know that's not what she was saying at all. But the way that it sounded was that Alice hadn't been what she was supposed to be, rather than Alice was robbed of the opportunity to share her best self with the world. Into your hands, O oh merciful Savior, we commend your servant Alice. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. 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 I just felt like I had to remind people that she was struggling and that we needed to remember that part of her, that we loved her no matter what. My father died a few months after Alice, I think in great part because having someone so young and loving and happy and just selfless like Alice was, purposefully killed like that made the world very cold and very cruel feeling. He just couldn't do it anymore. He couldn't see a way to claw himself out of that hole when he got in the hospital and he made the choice to say, I don't want to fight anymore, just let it happen. We buried some of Alice's ashes with him that day. The rest I kept for myself, and I'd like to scatter them in a special spot if I ever feel ready. A few days before my dad went into the hospital for the last time, he wrote me an email. Edwin, I know you must be sad about what happened to Alice. We all are. Bad things happen to good people all the time. We lost Philip 10 years ago, and I still think of him almost every day. You will still miss and grieve for Alice, but you can also enjoy those around you and the good and important things in your life. You're married now and about to become a new father, and that's really exciting stuff, so don't let thoughts of Alice get in the way. Take care and give Cece and Cooper hugs from me. Much love. The first trial, the Mike Jones trial, some of the things I remember most, I first remember meeting Jerry Rothschild, the DA. I don't really want to get into the facts of this case and probably don't need to now that I think about it, but maybe just in general. It's fair to say that I, uh, um, I suppose my approach early on is um, all in. Is that a fair way to put it? He's very intense, let's put it that way, super smart, um, and gave us a good um, walkthrough of what the proceedings were gonna be like, what evidence we had, um, how the case was gonna go. And uh, that was just pretty disturbing, hearing the witnesses and the stories. Um, 
picture. The pictures, yeah. I didn't look at the pictures. I had enough of that stuff. Like, that's the thing. I, I, I really come to care about a lot of these people, but what I wish more than anything else is that I'd never met them. Because to meet them means you met the Grim Reaper too. And that's not what I want for anybody. One of two men accused in the killing of a Thunderbolt couple will spend the rest of his life behind bars. Michael Donta Jones was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences in Chatham County Court today. Wilkins is still waiting to stand trial. Evidence was so overwhelming that the jury deliberated for about 30 minutes and then came back with a unanimous guilty decision, which is pretty fast. It was so just that his own family was there and they actually apologized to my mom. <laughs> they went up and said, we're so sorry, this is not who we thought we raised. He stayed out of trouble his whole life until he met up with this Nate guy. There's a lot of racist websites that use them as proof of why we should be racist because these two nice white people were killed in cold blood by these two black people. Like that was the only, the only thing they were, just white and black. There's nothing else to the story or who they were or how they were raised or, or anything. It's, it's pretty disheartening to see their lives being taken and then being used as like evidence of why we should be racist. Look, look how these people weren't racist. Where did I get them? That's not in any way what I want their death to represent. For me, the most eye-opening piece of this whole experience is understanding what it is to be the family of the victim of violence. Oh, you know it too. How much this grief differs from grief for my parents or grief for my patients, grief in different ways. Because I'll never get over any of these losses, but even though my parents were young, they died of disease. It was something natural, though awful. With Alice, her death was entirely preventable. So, just got a text from my mom that the trial is tentatively set for April 9th. So today's October 18th. So over four and a half years after the murders, we'll finally get to try the guy who apparently was behind the whole thing. And I've been ready to face this for a while now. Uh, I just want it to be over at this point. It's just, it's really hard to have it keep lingering on. Hey, Mom. Hi, how'd it go today, honey? It was really, really good. Audrey was amazing. She really had a lot of good things to say. Yeah, I mean, she was incredible because she knew all of us. She knew us for longer than anyone else I've talked to and probably will talk to. That's the thing that's so crazy is that it's, you know, I didn't, I don't feel like I even knew her for the last six years of her life. I'm learning so much about her. You know, I don't think we ever knew that she had such a positive Effect. You know what's funny is that every single one of these interviews has said that about her. She just wanted to make other people happy. How did how did everyone else know when we didn't? Well, because when she, uh, she didn't act happy at home, you know. I don't know what the real Alice was. I mean, I think she was tormented. What was she tormented by? And when that adoption thing. I mean, I think that was a basic rejection that she just couldn't get over. Well, not, not to mention that, but I think she knew that we were all disappointed that she wasn't, that she was with Forrest and she couldn't get herself out of harm's way. My one great regret, I think, is that, you know, I just felt like I wasn't able to protect her as an older brother. Yeah. And I had every opportunity. I mean, the, that fucking guy was at our house all the time and looking me in the face and acting like he was a good person. We all knew. What do you do with that? Oh, that's so terrible. Mm -hmm. Sorry, anyway, sorry uh, I derailed your night before you uh, walked into performance, but 
I just wanted to share those things. Oh, that's okay. Listen, thanks to everyone for calling, okay? Yep, yep. And uh, I can hardly wait to hear more about it. Okay, well, I'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye, honey. Okay, bye. No one ever chose to be on that autopsy table. No one ever chose to be my patient. And I would say my ultimate goal is to try to find the answer to bring peace. Did they suffer? I found that to be time and again the number one thing. And fortunately, as in this case, I can honestly say they didn't suffer an extended period of time. And that's not to say that I can tell you exactly what happened. I wasn't there. But I can tell you what the evidence says. You have two people that are coming home from a night out on the town. And at some point, two individuals come out of the bushes, brandishing weapons, one of 45 and one of 22. The first shots were to the chin of both individuals, both leaning forward somewhat, perhaps in a defensive posture. They see it coming, so they drop and try to put their hands up. Miraculously, neither one of those shots hits a vital organ. They're both probably stunned at that point. What is a stun? What does that mean? Stunned, I mean, literally, they're psychologically, I think they're both going, what's going on here? This is outside the realm of normal experience. Nobody expects this to happen. While they're trying to process that, Forrest gets a shot to the chest. That shot leaves his arm. And given where his body is found, I believe he ends up on his knees and he's got a very large bruise to the small of his back. That bruise is approximately the size of a foot. That could be explained by a forceful kick as though you're putting someone down on the ground. Very clearly, the shooter then came up and put the gun against the back of his head and pulled the trigger. She has a shot to the side of her head, and it comes out the temple. I don't personally use the term execution style, but I certainly wouldn't object if someone called it that. The first week that I was home, I, I did not sleep for the first five nights. I don't know how that's possible, but I lay awake in this bed in this new strange house that should have been like the most amazing thing that we were buying a house together. It felt so cold and lonely and dark and terrifying. I felt like people could look at me through the window at any time. I didn't know what had happened. I didn't know who had killed them. I didn't know if, if there were people looking for them, if it was a robbery. I also thought the worst that like Alice and Forrest had asked for it. Like they were, they must have been dealing drugs. Like that's what I initially went to. They must have been doing something they shouldn't have been doing to get into this shit like this. Which in a way would have been more comforting. Like, oh, well at least you knew the risk. Like you could have seen it coming. Especially the way they were basically executed on their porch, you think, wow, okay, that's a message that someone's sending. But uh, that's kind of the fucked up thing is it's not, it's just like, 
It's like one day you flipped off someone in traffic and they decided to follow you home. I think about stuff like that all the time. When, when you think about having a poor reaction to someone or, or acting angrily. I think about, man, there's just, there's bigger things to worry about than, uh, than yelling at the person that gets your order wrong at Subway. <laughs> there were months where every single night I would dream about the crime scene. I'd dream about being there watching it go down, what must have happened and what must have been said. Especially, like, the less information we had, the more I just made it up in my own head. But the problem is now, <laughs> I've actually seen the autopsy photo, so I have seen it, and it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. Now I, I kind of dream about what could have been dream about times when we were younger and we, we were together. I dream about her meeting my children. I had a dream recently that Alice and Forrest were getting married and my family decided not to go to the wedding because we didn't support Alice getting married to someone who'd abused her. And then I dreamt that my own wife divorced me because of it. It's hard because we went from our small apartment which was all nice and cozy and little, and I feel like we did everything together. And then we moved into this big house, and I feel like we don't do everything together anymore. Some days, Ed and I just cannot get on the same page, and we're both angry and upset, and we can't articulate exactly what is wrong with either one of us, but we're just both lashing out at each other all day long. Sometimes I feel like something triggers Ed somehow, and he just has something in his head, and no matter what I do, I can't seem to support him the right way, I guess. And sometimes I think I just get so sick and tired of trying so hard to make sure that I don't trigger him that I'm just done. You? Well, I knew that you were drinking too much, and I was really, really worried about that. And I'm a comfort eater. I knew you were eating too much. Before Alice died, I had been getting in pretty good shape for the wedding, and, uh, after she died, I just didn't feel the motivation to improve myself anymore. I didn't care about myself as much. I felt like tomorrow someone could run up on me and kill me, so why wouldn't I just do whatever I wanted all the time until that happened? So I ate whatever I wanted, didn't work out anymore. Haven't really worried about eating or working out for like four years. And it's affected my health pretty drastically. I'd been a pretty devout Christian for 27 years, and then this happened, and it just completely changed my outlook. It just felt like random chaos, and that even if there is a, a Christian God like that, how could I trust that God? How could I worship that God when he did this to my family? People told me a lot of cliche things. They said, well, she's in a better place now which frankly just made me think, well, why am I here then? If I, there's another place waiting for me out there, why are we all struggling so hard to stay alive? I think we've convinced ourselves that there's better things out there so that life doesn't seem so sad. And then the other thing people would tell me is everything happens for a reason, which I just thought, you know, what the hell does that even mean? What could even be a possible reason that would make this worthwhile? And uh, it's really hard to, uh, to be motivated to take care of myself in a world where that can happen to someone who's so wonderful.
on the way to Savannah, I just increasingly felt my stomach drop and my heart rate elevate. The only reason I ever came to Savannah was after Alice was murdered. This place just gives me the creeps. <clears throat> As things look right now, there are very few witnesses that are allowed to talk. So we're getting pretty nervous. Mike Jones, the first defendant, is the one who's incriminated Nate Wilkins. We're not allowed to use anything that he said. Nate Wilkins has been pretty quiet, whereas with the first defendant, he told everyone. So there's no physical evidence, and there's very little circumstantial evidence as well. Just really want to know what's going to happen with this trial. I have to sit like five feet from the person who killed my sister. And it's really hard to sit there next to them, breathe the same air. Can you imagine come, him coming in looking like that, all studious with his glasses on and this nice shirt and his pants, and no chains? It meant nothing to him. It meant absolutely nothing to him that he killed somebody. Could care less. Here's why we're here. This is Forrest Ice. He's 27 years old. Let's go and kill the lights so you can see this. His girlfriend was Alice Stevens. She was 24. They were young, and they were in love, and they worked together. That's how they looked when they were alive. Next picture. Here's what he did to them. There are drive-by shootings. There are accidental shootings. Then there's this thing, up close and personal, about as petty and dumb and mean as a motive as you're going to find. I think when you have horrific crimes like this, there's pressure on the prosecution to come up with some sort of resolve. And sometimes that pressure forces them to try to put square pegs in round holes. And they try to make it fit to get a certain result. And that's what happened in this case. Chris Travey is the one who found the bodies and called 911, heard the shots ran after the perpetrators, got a decent look at them. I heard um, two gunshots and a god-awful loud scream. Human you know, scream, I, animal scream, what kind of scream? Like human scream, like you'd see in a horror movie. Did, can you, if you know, you know. Did it sound male or did it sound female? It was a female as to the extent it would make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. It's tough to hear about Alice's blood-curdling screams said it sounded like something that you hear in a horror movie. I think I feel sadder than I was when I came here because I had to relive so many times hearing her scream, no, Nate, no, Nate. Then came the really hard stuff. We went through the autopsies at nauseam. We went through all the pictures of where the bullets entered their bodies, where they exited their bodies, where the fragments of bullets were found in Forrest's skull. It's just brutal. Body. To account for the bruise in the back, I kick oh. the back. I send them to the ground. I walk over, final shot. At this point, I would say... I just kept imagining the terror that she felt. I, I really feel so terrible that... at what she must have felt, knowing that the guy was going to shoot her. You pull the trigger on that, are you going to get blood spatter on that gun? Yes, sir. You're going to have what's called blowback, where material comes back onto the weapon. Uh, blood, mainly brain tissue, back onto the weapon. That's all that is, wouldn't it? Tell us your name, please, sir. Michael Jones. Um, Michael Jones, you're currently incarcerated um, based on the same murder prosecution, is that correct? Yep. That said, um, you know this guy? I refuse to answer anything else. Do you know this defendant? I refuse to answer anything else. Let the record show I said that. 
Obviously. He's not going to say anything. He's certainly not going to help on purpose, but I had a question. Yeah. Did this man participate in this thing? I refuse to answer any question that you got for me. Does he know, do you know anything about this murder? I think it's funny. I refuse to answer anything. Well, you understand that if you choose to testify as court, you don't get protected. Yeah. I got two licenses without parole. What's the difference? Well, that's why I'm asking you. 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 They brought Mike Jones to the stand, but he was just super defiant. He laughed a couple times. I mean, he clearly just thinks this is all a big joke. Like, look at me, look how cool I am that I did this. And it's hard to know that the guy he did it with is sitting there still fighting to get away with it. And that he has a shot at it is unbelievable. It's scary. So the morning was a mess. I heard you testify a little while ago that one of the gentlemen had dreads. Yes, sir. You have never stated that before in the four and a half years this case has been pending, have you? The witness, Chris Trebu, suddenly today, he remembers dreadlocks on one of the people. He's never said that in four years before. So clearly he's seen pictures of the defendant with dreadlocks and he's trying to help too much. The chief of police in Thunderbolt, he had to leave the trial because he has a heart condition and uh, he was looking pretty bad. Oh, Chief's been very sick. Yeah, Chief Merriman's been very sick. From our vantage point, it looks like he's solely holding out for this trial. So Chief Merriman gets on the stand and man, he's looking gray. He is not feeling well and you can tell. Oh boy. You just testified to the jury. She admitted that she was driving. Now you're saying that's not what took place? I may have been confused, Mr. Hedrich. The defense is trying to make him look like he botched the police work, and now he looks like this confused old man, and you're like, maybe he can convince the jury that he's a confused old man, and he, he messed up his last case. There's only one person who was actually there whose testimony matters, and her name's Tracy Burgess Wilkins. She's Nathaniel Wilkins' sister. She drove the getaway car. She had a first-hand account and saw everything go down. If her testimony comes off as credible, I think we're in a good spot. However, she's not very credible. She forgets things. She's changed her story a few times. So it's uh, hard to say whether or not a jury will find her as a credible witness. Because that's basically this whole case now. He's pointing the gun to her, and what did she say? No, Nate. No, Nate. No, Nate. You heard her say your brother's name? Yes, sir, out loud. Then what happened? That's when my brother pulled the trigger and shot her directly in the neck, and she fell. What happened next? So that's when the male victim decided to make one more step and might pump every round inside of his chest. Did Daniel ever describe to them as anything in particular? My brother told people that he got rid of some germs and bacteria. With Jerry, Tracy did okay, but the defense just started tearing her apart. She got facts wrong. She got dates wrong. She got the timing wrong. She kept messing up her story. She looked pretty bad. Let me ask you this. Did you tell someone at one point in time that at the time of the shooting, you were in the back seat of the vehicle having sex with Michael? Yes, sir, I told my baby sister. According to that lie, who is the shooter then if Michael Jones is in the back seat having sex with you? Michael Jones was the shooter. We could have stopped having sex and he could have got out. It's unsettling how nervous we are about the outcome of this trial considering what we know. That shouldn't be in doubt. There should be no doubt. Things aren't looking good for us right now. Jerry told us that there's a plea deal on the table. Nate and his representation are offering that they'll plead guilty to one count of manslaughter, which gets him 20 years. He'd probably serve 14 or 16 of those and then be paroled. He's already served three and a half, which he would get credit for time served. And uh, people are seriously considering taking this plea deal. Personally, it doesn't make a difference to me whether he gets out in a week or if he gets out in 15 years, is that he deserves to be in jail forever. If he gets out at all, it's a failure to me. What's the rest of my life look like knowing that this guy's out there? 
so we all thought about it that night and really agonized about, about it. The next morning we go in and I very reluctantly said maybe that's best to do because the defense attorney seemed to be trying to discredit the witnesses so badly. I didn't know how the jury would react. So we brought the plea to the defense who suggested the plea bargain in the first place. And then the defendant turned around and said, nah, I don't want it after all. I think I can win this thing. So after crying and fighting and deliberating about this plea bargain all morning and me essentially losing the argument, now we're going to try the case anyways. If you would, sir, please speak up loud and clear and tell the ladies and the gentlemen of the jury your name. Jairus Bernard Cooper. It's called Jairus. J-O-R-I-S. Did you know? It's George Cooper also was a witness. Uh, he worked in the kitchen at Blowing Smoke with Mike and Nate. And Mike started bragging to him about how he committed this murder. And then when Nate rolled up at the end of the night, Mike took out a bloody shirt and said, look at this, this is the blood that we, that we wiped off the gun. It's the t-shirt we used to wipe the blood and our prints. The only reason there's blood on the gun is because there was a contact shot in the back of the head. The forensic evidence is now backing up George Cooper's statement. Suddenly he looks like a much more credible witness than just this streetwalker, as the defense called him a street person who is testifying looking for some reward money. Let's look at Tracy Burgess, who is the foundation to their case. What is, what is Tracy Burgess? Tracy Burgess is a thief. She is a liar. Her testimony has been contradicted by every other witness's testimony in this case. So not only is she a proven liar, she is a admitted liar. They've been harping and harping on Tracy being a liar. She said she was on this street, but she was actually on this street. She said that she wasn't the driver, but she was, and now she's admitting that she's a driver. So the defense brings out one piece of evidence, this tape of Tracy being escorted to the jail in a police car with Chief Merriman. I'm like, oh man, she's gonna look so bad on this. She's gonna look, she's gonna tell yet another story that we don't even know about. She's gonna look like a liar. Tracy was just sobbing her heart out. I mean, she was crying hysterically. So I think that was the real Tracy. And she's, she's told a different story then than she had before. But she's never wavered, ever, 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 no matter how many different stories she's had, that it was Mike Jones, who was her boyfriend at the time, and Nate Wilkins were the killers. It's nerve wracking to just sit there with nothing to do except think about what the hell this verdict could be, or if there will be a verdict. There's only one way that this trial can go that will walk away somewhat satisfied. We need the verdict to be guilty. If there's a hung jury, then we're gonna have to come back and do this thing all over again. They say these things don't usually get better. Usually if you get one hung jury, that means that he's on the way to getting out eventually because witnesses don't remember things better as time goes on. Obviously, if he's found not guilty, then that is the worst possible outcome. Please, please let it be guilty. Please let it be guilty. Please. 
Defend it, Rise. In the Superior Court of Chatham County, State of Georgia, State of Georgia versus Nathaniel Willie Wilkins, jury verdict. Count one, malice murder. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of malice murder. Count two, malice murder. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of malice murder. Count three, felony murder. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty on felony murder. Count four, felony murder. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of felony murder. Count five, aggravated assault. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of aggravated assault. Count six, aggravated assault. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of aggravated assault. Today, it's finally done. The verdict came back guilty. What an elated feeling. And then it was guilty. Guilty, guilty. I had to not offend anybody by showing joy at the verdict. What kind of justice is that for the victim? Good news and some bad news. The good news is they found him guilty. Oh, that's awesome, honey. That's so good. I'm really happy to hear that. The bad news is I have to stay through Thursday because they're sentencing him on Thursday. Because they're doing what Thursday? They're sentencing him on Thursday. Oh, okay. Okay. All right, well, I mean... Hmm? That's great, though. Yeah. Okay, well, I just want to let you know. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. I'm so happy. I'm so glad. I love you. I love you, too. Okay, I'll talk to you later. Okay. Bye. Bye. That didn't go very well. I had hoped that if and when this moment happened, that it would change everything, that... I'd be able to get on with my life. <sighs> the things would just instantly get better. And there is a weight lifted, there is. The justice system has done all that it can, but Alice is still dead. Two people in the middle of the night still snuck up on her and shot her at close range. That makes the world feel a little less safe to me, knowing that can happen to someone like Alice. She didn't instigate anything. She didn't have anything to do with what happened except that she was just there when two people had guns and were after her boyfriend. I have three kids. It, it scares the shit out of me that they live in that world. One thing I think these families want at the end of the trial is for Mr. Rothschild to stand up after a verdict and go, now we're gonna open the back rooms to the courtroom and here comes your family member back to sit down with you and leave. That's never gonna happen, but that's the one thing they want is the one thing I can't ever give them. Ethically and emotionally and spiritually and every other way, they're just lost. And so I'm not gonna say they get closure, what they get is a starting line, not a finishing line. What they can do is start the rest of their life. I've tried to be a good person my whole life, but I'm not a good Christian. I don't forgive him. I don't forgive him. 
I want everybody to know that they can tell me, oh, it's time to get on with your life. Now you can finally move on, or it's closure. It's not a closure. The grief is still there. It will always be there. There will always be an empty chair at the dinner table. There will always be an empty place at holidays. Don't, I hope nobody says that to me. You know, Alice kind of had trouble finding herself. But as you found out, she meant a lot to so many people. She just not, did not have the opportunity to fulfill her potential. Want a little card to go with that? No, they're for me. Oh. My daughter's birthday is tomorrow. She was murdered four years ago, so those are her favorite flowers, and we're just honoring her. That's very That's sweet. Beautiful. You got it? Yeah, I think so. All Thank, right. you. Thank you. Thank you. I gave up everything in my life to be a priest. I gave up my career. I cashed in my savings to be able to declare to everyone that they are part of this eternal wonder of God. And Alice's murder made me stop and question if I could do that anymore. And there are still days when I stand up in front of a congregation and the prayer that I have before going out there is that I need God to show up and do it because I can't, that I will be the vessel, but it can't, it can't be me. It can't be my words because there are days that it just doesn't make sense to me anymore. So today is Alice's birthday. It's been four years since she died. She would be 28 today. She loved turquoise, so that's why I have uh, the turquoise trim. The sunflowers for her favorite flower. And it's a white cake. I prefer chocolate, but today, since we're honoring Alice, it has to be a white cake. Happy birthday to my little Alice, who we love and miss every single day. Wish you were here, Alice. And I wish you liked chocolate instead of white cake. Dear Philip, how have you been doing? It's been so long since we've hung out. Remember when you last came to Maine? It was at least four or five years ago. You came out of the airplane with a new hairdo, and when we realized it was you, we sang When a Man Loves a Woman, because you reminded us of Michael Bolton. This person is Alice. I remember that day perfectly, too. You couldn't stop complaining about how cold you were, but you should have thought about the Maine weather. Actually, I have a weird story about your wedding. When the music was playing and everyone was dancing, I was dancing with you, which I have a wicked awesome picture of, and we both kind of have the same smile. You look so happy. That picture is strange because I know the exact song we were dancing to. It was called Dancing in Heaven by Cube Feel, and I downloaded it when we got home and listened to it all the time. But I find it so ironic because it talks about being in heaven and despite all the drugs you did, your addiction to alcohol and the way you selfishly took your own life, there's no way God couldn't have let you into heaven with your amazing smile and your good heart. I think 
Maybe if I was just there and told you I loved you, maybe, just maybe, you would have rethought it. I don't know. I'm just rambling. I just want you to know I love you and that not a day goes by where I don't think of you. Love, your little sis, Alice. I don't think I'll ever really heal fully from Alice's murder. I'm probably changed forever in many ways. But making this film has made me realize how much love Alice gave to the world and how much she was loved during her life, even if she wasn't aware. And if she's out there somewhere, which I would love, I hope she's able to hear people take time out of their day to tell me how wonderful she was so incredible to know that she made a difference. What kinds of things bring you happiness now? Being with my family, being with my grandkids. What happened? Broke. You had too many eggs? No, I guess. I think so. <laughs> I'm going to do my best to keep Alice's memory alive through my family. I know that she wouldn't want me to completely fall apart, that she'd want me to be there, to be a good father, to be a good husband. My wife and I just renewed our marriage vows recently, and our new anniversary is nowhere near the date that Alice was murdered. And as much as I don't want to leave Alice completely in the past, I hope that this is one small step forward in my quest to find happiness again. Hey! Oh, look at you! <laughs> 